as I've said, uh, this is uh, not the first installment of this uh, virtual uh, WebEx format, but uh, I do want to remind everybody that is sincere that I look forward to a, a time when we can all meet in person again. Uh, I want to thank you, however, for your patience and flexibility as we continue to work in this virtual format. If you have any technical difficulties, I think we're becoming pros at this. Um, it's not seamless ever, no matter what your proficiency is, but with your patience and now your experience, I think that we'll be able to uh, move through our agenda. But if you do have some difficulties getting dropped off, bandwidth, whatever, um, Michelle is your IT pro. Um, and if you um, want to use the chat feature there within this platform, then certainly that's probably the most efficient way to get prompt uh, action uh, so that we will know you're either logging in again or logging off or having to rejoin. But you, you also know that uh, you can contact her through email uh, on your desktop there. Uh, other housekeeping reminders. Um, the public is participating, uh, and that's by Judicial Branch YouTube channel. Uh, for any member that's not sharing video this morning, uh, I'm sad. <laughs> I like to see your faces, but uh, if, you, if you're going to go that route, join us uh, by audio only. You're going to have to announce yourself before speaking. Um, if you're sharing video, that's not necessary uh, for the record. Um, to be recognized for a question or comment, please use the chat feature in the WebEx uh, or send a message to everyone. Um, or if you need a private uh, exchange, you can do it straight to the host. There's also that uh, hand feature that you can uh, uh, adopt here in the participant column um, of the uh, WebEx uh, format. But you can also just raise your hand because I'm looking at you uh, and uh, we can. Uh, pretend that's the way uh, uh, it's it's done in real life. Um, any votes are going to have to be done by roll call. It's it's cumbersome, but uh, that's just necessary. I'm going to have to restate the motion and who made the motion, and Michelle will call the names. We'll only anticipate one vote in that format today, thankfully, and that's going to be for the minutes. Um, as usual, I want to give you a reminder uh, for your own records and maintaining your calendar that upcoming meeting dates. Uh, that are set in stone are June the 4th, September the 10th, and December the 3rd. And now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce a new member. Um, it's uh, a face I recognize. And for those of you that have not previously met our new member in, in, in his professional role in our state, it's uh, Michael Waters uh, of Prosecutorial District 11. I have a bio I'm going to read, uh, Mr. Waters, um, as part of your introduction. Um, but as I find that in my stack, I want everyone to know that, um, Luther as a Charlotte lawyer, we all have to remind him that, uh, there are things beyond the great state of Mecklenburg and, um, and I have no, um, illusions that, uh, all roads lead to Salisbury or anything like that. But, um, but Salisbury does have connections with a lot of you uh, for a variety of reasons, and, and uh, Mr. Waters is no exception. Um, and I'll I'll have more to say about that, or perhaps he will in a second. But let me let me uh, read through his bio. So for those of you that uh, are seeing him in his in the panel here, if you got the Brady Bunch view going, um, he uh, is the elected DA for Prosecutorial District 11. That includes Franklin, Granville, Person, Vance, and Warren counties. That's amazing to me. He was first elected in 2014. He was reelected for a second term in 2018. He's a native of Granville County. He graduated from UNC Chapel Hill on a teaching fellows scholarship. He taught middle school before attending North Carolina Central Law School where he was a cl the class president and he received the prestigious Floyd McKissick Senior Leadership Award, one of our long serving uh, fellow commissioners, someone whom we miss. Um, prior to uh, Mr. Waters election as district attorney, he was a founding partner of Perry and Waters, concentrating on criminal and domestic law and a participant in the Guardian at Lighting program advocating for abused and neglected children. Mike is married to Bridget and they have a son, Ben. Uh, his wife, Bridget, <clears throat> brings me to my Salisbury connection. His wife grew up in Salisbury. His wife is um, one of four siblings, 
Um, uh, my orthodontist, uh, my family's orthodontist, her older brother, Brett, um, is a, a bike racing friend of mine who I have regular contact with. Um, but then it's Brett, Bart, Brooke, and Bridget. Um, and uh, Bart, uh, it goes more, you know, Brett's uh, younger brother, Bart, is a former ADA who uh, practiced in Salisbury for years, and now he's gone on to make a mint in banking and practicing law in other states. But um, with those uh, few connections highlighted, I'll invite uh, everyone to welcome uh, our newest commissioner, Mr. Waters, and would invite him, if he'd like to say anything, to correct my introduction or uh, his bio. Welcome, Mr. Waters. <clears throat> So, um, at this point, we'll uh, move on to the um, approval of the minutes, as well as introductions of for the for the record of the rest of us. Uh, we're going to handle this simultaneously. I need to kind of go over this um, in a very sequential way, so that uh, the instructions will be clear, and uh, we'll may be made. Uh, uh, more clear as I read them to you. Um, there are some revisions, minor revisions to the minutes. So at this time, I'm going to recognize Michelle, since some of you have uh, opened them, reviewed them, and made a reference to a need for a couple clarifications. Michelle. Thank you, Judge Brown. Just wanted to point out there were a couple of typos, um, very, very minor, but did want to let you all know that those will be corrected. Um, in the official version of the minutes. So uh, I will solicit uh, a motion for the approval of the minutes with those uh, corrections, those technical corrections as uh, highlighted by Michelle. Move the minutes be approved as a motion. Second. All right, uh, only because my grid, uh, Danielle, shows uh, Calvin above you. <laughs> I'm going to consider Calvin's as the second there. So uh, the motion is that the minutes as revised uh, be approved. There's been a motion and a second. At this time, I'm going to ask Michelle to call the roll. Um, please respond present for the purpose of attendance. Uh, tell us who you represent when your name is called and then state your vote on the motion for the minutes. Michelle's going to put up, you can see it now, uh, occupying your screen. Uh, a listing of the members, and she's going to check your name off as you respond. If you don't see your name checked off, it means that we're not hearing you. So um, let's make sure we clarify that uh, with the, the functionality of the audio on and off mute functions. This time, I want to recognize Michelle. Thank you, Judge Brown. Um, I'll start with you, Judge Charlie Brown. Present and uh, I, uh, represent. Uh, at uh, the as our chairman, and I am appointed by the Chief Justice, and I'm I'm voting aye. Francis Battle. I am present, and I represent the North Carolina Systems Network, um, and I vote aye. Art Beeler. Aye. I'm currently representing the governor. Sheriff Clemens. Sheriff Clemens, I representing the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. Senator Daniel. Louise Davis. Danielle Elder. Danielle Elder, I'm present. Work for the Department of Justice, rep, uh, appointed by the North Carolina Attorney General, and I approve the minutes. Judge Elliott. Present. I represent the North Carolina District Judges Association, as I'm the current president of that association. And as to the minutes, um, I... Representative Faircloth. Um, I am here today on behalf of Representative Faircloth. My name is Lindsay Davis, and Representative Faircloth is the elected House of Representatives member for District 62. Thank you, Lindsay. Senator Fitch. 
Fitch. Chairman Fowler. Fitch, Fitch present. Ordered by President Tempera and the Senate. I vote in. Thank you, Senator. My apologies. Chairman Fowler. Uh, present. <clears throat> Appointed by the governor. Aye. Lindsey Granados. Lindsey Granados. Present, I represent the North Carolina Advocates for Justice and I vote aye as to the minute. Judge Horn. Uh, present, represent the Superior Court Judges Conference and vote aye as to the minute. Susan Captain Nelson. Present, I present the governor and aye for the minute. Chief King. Present, I vote aye, and I represent the Chiefs Association. Tammy Lee. Uh, present, uh, I represent North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. I vote yes for the minute. Dr. McMurray. Representative McNeil. Present, I vote aye. I represent House District 78, North Carolina House, uh, appointed by Speaker Tim Moore. Jim Nixon. Good morning, uh, President. I vote aye. And I represent the North Carolina Conference of Clerks of Superior Court. Luther Moore. I'm present. I represent the North Carolina Retail Merchants Association, and I vote yes for the minutes. Tim Mood. President, represent the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, Adult Correction, Juvenile Justice, and vote aye. Judge Morrison. President, Chairman's appointee, representing Justice Fellowship, vote aye for the minutes. Representative Richardson. President, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm appointed by Speaker Tim Moore, representing the North Carolina House, District 44, and I vote aye on the minutes. Senator Steinberg. Present, represent Senate District 1, appointed by Senator Phil Berger, and uh, I vote yes, approve the minutes. Calvin Suber. Present, appointee by the chairman, representing Royan County. My vote is yes. Mr. Waters. Patrick Weed. I'm Patrick Weed. Uh, I'm uh, present. I uh, vote uh, aye to approve the minutes, and I'm an appointee of the North Carolina Bar Association. Judge Zachary. I represent the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I was appointed by Chief Judge Linda McGee, and I vote aye. Roll call complete, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Michelle. Real quick, I'll review the agenda. And uh, before I do that, I uh, will begin by thanking uh, both Tim Moose and Nicole Sullivan, who on short notice um, are going to be presenting uh, on this uh, important and uh, highlighted uh, item on our agenda. It was a last minute request. And uh, Tim, Nicole, thank you so much for uh, being here to present on the prison population settlement. The overview will uh, be uh, what they'll uh, present and we'll have a chance to discuss it as a commission as well as question, have some questions for them about the details of the settlement. Uh, then um, we will move into the actual population projection that our staff published. Um, and uh, obviously the point of having the settlement uh, presentation before that is because it's likely to have some impact and uh, on the now published projections. The agenda then will uh, include 
um, a presentation by staff uh, uh, on the youth development center projections. Um, we have present uh, uh, Billy Lassiter, uh, who is the secretary of juvenile justice uh, and other members of his team that will be available to uh, perhaps uh, field questions on the presentations regarding the YDC projections. And then <clears throat> on the statewide misdemeanor confinement capacity, uh, staff member will uh, present on that uh, uh, data. And uh, we have Jesse Scholler from the Sheriff's Association who, who will likely be available to field questions about that presentation. And then uh, finally, uh, Michelle is gonna talk with us a little bit about this study that uh, um, has been an ongoing topic of our discussion, the um, disparity um, study uh, and where we are moving to finalize a contract to uh, uh, have some assistance in coming up with uh, a product there. So that's a, still a work in progress and we plan to give you an update before we adjourn today. So at this time, <clears throat> we're going to uh, begin with the top of our agenda and uh, hear uh, from both Tim Moose and Nicole Sullivan on the prison population settlement. You should have received uh, in your packet of materials, both a hard copy um, or the attachments through email, uh, and uh, they may be part of the presentation and, and may be referenced. So if you'll have those at your disposal. At this point, uh, I'll recognize uh, Tim Moose and Nicole Sullivan. Hey, thank you, Judge. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone, and I uh, hope you all have a great weekend and maybe a rain-free weekend for once. That would kind of be nice. So um, the document that you have is kind of the outline that uh, Nicole and I will follow. We'll sort of tag team. Um, I'll kind of go through those points on the document, and uh, Nicole was going to help me out and keep me straight and uh, fix whatever I say that's not correct, uh, which is possible uh, going through this document. I need to, to say um, to everyone here, all our judges and attorneys, this is not a legal um, document. This is our operational kind of overview of the settlement and in terms of our operations, what we would be doing um, to try to affect the settlement and the components of it. So um, I need to qualify that. So I'm certainly not an attorney. Um, Nicole's probably closer to one than I am, but uh, anyway. <laughs> um, going through the settlement agreement, uh, it's some of the main points uh, starting at the top of that page. Um, there's a, pro a 3,500 individual offenders that would be released during the next six months period. They will either um, transition out on extended limits of confinement or hit their post-release date uh, a little earlier than they normally would have perhaps and then they would go out on post-release supervision. Uh, most all folks today, um, as you all know, go out, they go out under supervision. In the extended limits of confinement program, um, Community Corrections also provides that supervision. And then there's a third component um, that is uh, special reviews by the Post Release and Parole Commission. So I'm gonna start with each of those uh, three avenues that we're looking at to go to, to get to that 3,500 number. And Nicole, um, you know, chime in and, and I'll stop and defer to you on all those areas. Um, at first, I want to say that last year, um, 21,126 individuals left our prison system and went back to our communities in the state. So I think most everybody here knows that 90% plus of individuals who go to prison come back to our communities and they, they transition back out after serving that period of incarceration. Most come back out, they're on post-release supervision uh, that community corrections oversees and provides that supervision. Um, since April of 2020, uh, as a, a response to the pandemic, um, prisons has been engaged in everything you see here on this page. So in terms of the settlement agreement, 
and the operations of it, most all these elements are things that were already underway and that Prisons was already doing going all the way back to April of 2020. Um, so I think that's important to understand. And the three areas that we'll be working to get to the 3500th number, um, all of these areas are looking at individuals that have already have post release dates of 2021. So it's not extending out and going uh, people who are not supposed to be released till 2025 or 26 or 2030 or anything like that. It's individuals that already have a date scheduled to come out during 2021. The extended limits of confinement program, you see the statutory reference there. Um, that provision of statute has been used by prisons and the former Department of Correction and the current Department of Public Safety for many, many years. And that's the provision that uh, typically uh, we reference for things like work release and home leave and those kind of uh, things that you're mo more familiar with maybe. Um, in response to the pandemic, it has been used to transition individuals out um, to the community uh, in a, a, a setting, a residential setting, or either in a transitional house um, to finish their prison sentence. Once they then hit their PRD date, they uh, transition on to post-release supervision and move on with the process. Anybody that's been transitioned out on the extended limits of confinement uh, there's a set of rules and regulations and expectations they have to follow if they become non-compliant or fail to do any of the things that have been set out for them to do. Uh, they're picked up and returned to prison. Um, and they've had their opportunity uh, under this initiative. Um, before the settlement, over 1,030 individuals had been transitioned out. Um, most uh, had completed that their period of time, hit their PRD date, moved on to post-release supervision. The terms of the settlement, um, you see the, the number one and two there, the essential criteria is that uh, the individuals have a 2021 projected release date and the uh, they're not anyone who is uh, in prison for a crime against a person is not eligible to be considered it's actually an automatic disqualifier. And Nicole, I don't know if you want to pick me up there or kind of add to those elements. Um, sure, Mr. Moose, just, just briefly, I think just to highlight for the commission um, that uh, in general, that criteria around crimes against a person um, um, is a, takes out a pretty good chunk of the folks in our prison system. So when you think about who's even uh, eligible to be considered for ELC, um, it's a much smaller population that is actually incarcerated. So it's a very narrow band of people who even begin, uh, can even begin that process of review uh, once you apply that filter of crimes against a person. Uh, and then, of course, looking at the 2021 release dates, the impact we've seen with uh, entries and exits, that's another subset of, of the group of people who are incarcerated because we haven't had lots of people come in. So we're primarily decaying the population, if you will, of folks who were already there uh, and already had these 2021 release dates. So it, it, it this group is pretty narrow uh, in terms of who's currently incarcerated in, in, in the population that can be considered for extended limits. Okay, the second component is the discretionary credit awards and you see the statutory references there. And again, I'll just say that that's part of the process that's been going on for years and years. I think most everybody understands or knows that um, those credits basically when an individual comes into prison, they come in under the Senate structure somewhere close to their maximum sentence that the judge has ordered. They, less any jail time credit that the court gives that's set up and then they have the opportunity to earn credits to get closer to their minimum sentence um, to have that post release date closer to that mandatory minimum or flat minimum whatever the correct term is there Nicole but that process has been in place um, 
because of many things that were suspended during the pandemic, like education and program opportunities, the uh, individuals coming from outside our communities into our prisons to provide those teaching and educational opportunities. Most of those things have been suspended and, and are still suspended as prisons has mitigated uh, the pandemic and doing everything it can to try to stop the spread and, and stop serious illness and, and do everything it can do to prevent this. Um, they went through a process and developed some credits that are still discretionary credits like any other participating in programs or educational treatment. But these are about essentially good behavior um, and doing what that person should do uh, during this uh, time when everything is essentially shut down and there are a lot of opportunities for individuals who are incarcerated to grow and learn and change behavior because of how things have, have been basically confined within the institution, if you will. Um, so those individuals have earned those credits uh, just like they always have. Most everyone who leaves prison of that 21,126 that left prison during calendar year 2020, most of those left prison had earned some type of credit towards their sentence and into um, getting closer to that minimum sentence when they exited prison. Um, and so this is a continuation of that. And I guess I should say this for clarification, whether or not the pandemic existed or not, that would be a process that prisons would use. And it's a behavior management tool. I think if uh, Commissioner Ishii were here or any of our senior prison leadership were here, they would tell you how important it is to be able to have uh, this as part of what they do to better manage the prison population better and, and be able to give hope and let people move forward in the process of what they need to do to serve their sentence and, and try to uh, prevent uh, assaults on staff and many other things that occur inside the prison. So I don't know, Nicole, you. The, the only thing I'd add just um, for historical purposes, because um, I definitely see some folks who've been a part of the commission for, for a while. Um, it, while discretionary sentence credits in particular are a particular group, um, it is it was this actual group, the commission, who um, urged and recommended to the department to do um, and I always get my earn and gain time, but the credits for structured sentencing, which I think are earn time, but maybe it's gain time. I always get them confused, even 28 years in. Um, which one is it, Michelle? Is it earn or gain? <laughs> I know earn. between Michelle and Susan and John, y'all yeah. are. So, so one of them knows. Well, but, right. It's one but, of them. It's one of those, and and the, and the commission recommended um, that we increase those again because this is as as Mr. Moose just said, it is a part of the management tool. It is about a part of the population management tool, uh, and we did increase these rates uh, for specific program specific employment uh, that individuals are doing while they're incarcerated, and that has really and I think we did that back in 2010 is one of the times that we looked at that those, those issues. Um, and the cost of incarceration and the use of uh, those precious prison beds. And we did increase those rates to help folks again, move to those um, uh, minimum sentences a lot quicker. So um, I just would just for historical, just to know this group also recommended, this is a, a good way to manage, to help manage the population and manage within uh, the resources that the state already uh, has in place. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Tim. Now, before I invite uh, questions or just general discussion in light of the overview, um, I guess my comment, Tim, Nicole, is um, <clears throat> thousands and thousands and thousands of inmates uh, under the settlement must be released in six months. You've already released due to COVID and beyond your normal um separation process over a thousand uh in the past year through through elc and you're featuring elc as the way to achieve your now settlement mandate 
uh, in the next six months, is it possible to work within since you have this filter that's going to narrow that eligible population to non offenses against person to even achieve that number? So, um, certainly we think so. Um, and Nicole, I don't know if you want to expand on kind of the process. And, and I would say that as far as the count to get to that 3,500. Uh, I think eventually most of the count is going to be comprised of discretionary credit people. Um, and then also there's a, a third avenue that's the special reviews by the post release supervision and parole commission. And the commission is looking at um, the map release project as well as those individuals who have technical violations of post release supervision that come back to them and that they can then reinstate to supervision under community corrections and adjust um, the conditions of supervision or require some other things. I know Chairman Fowler is on. Um, he certainly can chime in on that. But I do think that the majority of the count is not going to be extended limits of confinement. It would just be individuals that transition through that get the discretionary credits that are coming out and their PRD date would be a little earlier than it would have been otherwise in 2021. But Nicole, you wanna? No, I think I, yeah, no, I think that's correct. Um, I, I think um, when we look at the 1,033, and it, it may be a little higher uh, today, that that group was specifically only counting that ELC population um, that, that were transferred out. So in, in the settlement, um, we certainly think a combination uh, is going to have to take place, and that's necessarily not going to be ELC is the major group um, because it is such a narrow band. So, I mean, that's a good point, Judge Brown. It, it is a narrow group, and I think the, the main point there is getting folks to recognize that's a very narrow, special group. Uh, and operationally, we'll have to look at individuals um, who have these 2021 release dates and identify what's going to be the best method to affect that either transfer or that release based on these mechanisms that we have available to us. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you did. That is responsive and it, and it, and it clarifies for me that uh, certainly Tim covered that there are multiple tools that will be in play. Uh, and it, I, I just erroneously seized on it being a major focus at ELC. So thank you for that uh, insight. I now want to uh, uh, recognize uh, Representative McNeil. Uh, he has a question. Representative McNeil. Thank you. And, and I, I won't uh, take too much time today because I've already had a chance to <clears throat> question Mr. Moose already this week about this. Uh, but I will just ask uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, the whole point of this lawsuit was over COVID. Uh, is that correct? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Sorry, I lost my cursor trying to click off a of mute. I'm sorry. All yes, sir. Right. The whole purpose of the lawsuit was over the COVID pandemic, correct? Yes, sir. And and what is the current positivity rate in testing and in, in within the prison? Uh, the current active rate or the number of individuals that are incarcerated right now that are active with COVID is, is dropped to somewhere around 1% of the current population. And do you know what the positivity rate in, in the general public is or approximately? Uh, I know it's approximately higher than that on, on each. <laughs> Would it be fair to say it's over 6%? Probably so. so. So is there any consideration? I mean, everybody's since they started has said, you know, follow the science. Does, it seems to me like you're taking someone from a 1% positivity rate environment and putting them into a 6% positivity environment. It seems like you're actually not doing them any favor, you're putting them in into a situation where they're more likely to, to catch the virus. So uh, has that been any consideration in, in the talks in the settlement? Um, I can say it definitely was. I mean, there was a lot of conversation about those uh, elements. 
um, as well as the congregate living situation and how fast that um, COVID had spread inside our institutions earlier. Um, and I think that uh, one of the challenges that prisons faced is it's the facilities are not built or set up to isolate folks and to separate out uh, individuals when they do become positive, those that live in the dorm environments uh, were a particular challenge to them. And I think those were some of the, the reasons behind and the density in, my, in most all of the prison locations, other than the newer prisons that have single cell environments. Well, there's one final question, and then, and then I will I'll say, because I think we're going to talk about this again some more next week. Uh, at the height of, of this, what was your uh, highest positivity rate at, at the height? Uh, it's 1% now, you say, or right around. How bad did it get? Um, I can certainly get the commissioner to provide that information to you. I know it was above 15%. Um, at least, and it may have been higher than that. I don't know, Nicole. Do you remember it? You know, one point. I don't have that, but I was thinking in the double digits as well. Um, somewhere about 15, 16 percent is what I recall as well. All right, just a final comment, Mr. Chair. You know, uh, just from what I'm hearing, at one point the positivity rate in the prisons was 15 percent. It's down to one percent now. We're sending 3,500 people into a general population with a at least a 6% or a higher positivity rate. It just seems like the wrong time to, to, to do this settlement uh, when things are starting to get better. So that That's my comments and questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Representative McNeil. Other comments or questions? I, I see Susan. Susan, good morning. I'll recognize uh, Commissioner Katzen Nelson. Thank you, Judge. I have a quick research related question. This I believe the settlement is a natural experiment. Is a comparable sample that has not been released? I think that would tell us something unrelated to the uh, to the situation with the virus. Susan, I'm going to have to stop you. Um, you you're breaking up. And you're, Susan, your video and audio are breaking up. And, and so, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to hear the question. Um, so we're having technical difficulties, uh, both uh, audio and video. Uh, perhaps we can work on that. Um, and, and, and while we work on that, I'll go ahead and recognize Commissioner Lee because she has a question. Commissioner Lee. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Moose, um, for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, within the 3,500 um, that's to be released, and you may have said it and I just missed it, but is there room to look at their um, current infractions and the severity of those infractions and and how current they are when releasing the, those inmates. Because it's, I mean, to me, it's clear that if they have um, had several internal infractions, then they, <laughs> they're they clearly not ready to um, go out into the general public and, and maintain any, um, maintain themselves as a productive citizen? Uh, yes, ma'am, that's a great question and it is taken under consideration and I can let Nicole kind of further explain how that process works, but uh, there are, uh, there is consideration for that um, and it, individuals uh, who have committed an A or uh, most B infractions, they're taken off the list for any kind of consideration. Anyone who has uh, committed an infraction or misbehaved and they've, have, they've landed in restrictive housing, they're taken out of the picture. So it does become a, a much smaller group being considered for any of these opportunities. And so, I, Nicole, if you want to 
it kind of explain how the process works or works. We have, uh, I think at last, last time I counted almost 30 staff from the different disciplines of adult correction and juvenile justice that have been working through these, all these areas since April. And so it's quite a bit of work that goes in behind the scenes before someone transitions to any of these options. Absolutely, Mr. Moose and um, Commissioner Lee, you're exactly right that that's a big area that we look at and we pay attention to. And as Mr. Moose said, certain serious A infractions definitely have been um, uh, basically disqualifiers or re resulted in a delay in people being considered. So if we got a name, they had that date, we started looking at them, we see this infraction, that usually put them kind of on pause uh, for several months before we would go back and look at them. And so that we're still using that criteria for ELC and that's also in place for the discretionary. Um, I'll actually tell you literally yesterday, a flyer has been posted and sent to all the facilities to basically tell everybody who does have a 2021 release date, be on your best behavior. Because <laughs> if, you, if you get an infraction, then that's gonna knock you out of consideration. And we literally just, sent that flyer out and posted it at every facility and put it in the hands of every incarcerated person and just said, here's your opportunity if you get yourself in trouble. And we've seen it. We've, we've, we've literally seen it in names that we were looking at that in the past week or two, they've now gotten a very serious infraction and, and now are knocking themselves out of that six month window of being able to, to uh, effectuate their release or transfer. Um, and I didn't mean to exclude you from my comments. I just couldn't remember your name because I'm terrible with names. <laughs> so no thank no you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. No problem. I see uh, Patrick Weed's hand. Uh, Commissioner Weed. Thank you. And uh, as others have said, thank you very much for the uh, presentation and all the helpful information. And I have a couple of um, two um, kind of unrelated questions. Uh, first, um, going along a little bit what Ms. Sullivan just said, is there a mechanism for inmates who are or who do have a release date of 2021 um, to either petition, you know, to, to request to be released or to be heard on that, or if they are not selected, um, you know, to, to get information as to why they're not selected? Is there any process or mechanism for that? My second question is, um, do you know the percentage of staff who have received the vaccine thus far? Um, and and also, um, is there going to be any mandate that uh, staff who are in contact with inmates have to receive the vaccine when it is their turn? Thank you. Uh, I, I will try to answer the first one and Mr. Moose may be trying to get the information for the second one. Um, um, I've not been as close to uh, vaccines and those things, um, primarily been focusing on ELC. But to your first question, yes, um, as a part of the flyer we just sent out, we made sure that folks know that they will automatically all be considered if they have a 2021 release date and they will be directly communicated with if if they are approved or, or not. So we, we will make that notification. And that was also part of that same uh, communication I just mentioned about infraction behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Commissioner, going into the first of this week, um, which is the latest numbers I have, 44% uh, of the um, prison staff has received their vaccination. They either, have either been fully vaccinated or have had the first dose and been partially vaccinated. And that work um, continues this week. Um, and then the uh, prisons has been in the vaccination process, have been receiving allocations of vaccines since the, the week of January 20th, I believe. And they've been uh, following the guidelines that have been set out by DHHS in terms of vaccinating staff and, um, and the inmate population, the offender population. Uh, their allocations will be um, increasing next week as there are more vaccine now available in the state and they'll be beginning to do more of the inmate population. Um, the vaccines right now are, are still uh, voluntary. Um, prisons is, is working in the midst of an education process with both the staff and the offender population, which was it's one of the uh, bullet points about the settlement too, where that continues. It's something that's already been going on and will continue to go on regardless of this case. Um, and 
as time has progressed, as more information has become available about the vaccines, as uh, uh, more individuals have received the vaccines and haven't had any issues or any reactions to it, what we're kind of seeing across all of our agencies in adult correction, juvenile justice, is that more and more staff are now coming forward and saying, I want to take the vaccine. So we anticipate that that's going to continue. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, first, uh, bless you, Danielle. <laughs> um, I see that we have Susan back. Uh, uh, both video and audio before I recognize her to see if we can get her question communicated. I did see that uh, Commissioner Granados had a chat question. Did that just get answered through Tim's response, Lindsay? Um, I believe it did um, for the most part. What what other what percentage do we have? And I guess how, what's the timeline that we anticipate getting most of the, or at least a, a kind of a critical mass of inmates um, vaccinated? So uh, during the next 30 days, I think you'll begin to see a great greater number of the population vaccinated. Most of the uh, inmates that are in the first two categories that we started with, the uh, I believe over 75 and then the over 65 were the first two groups. Um, and a, a large majority of those um, wanted the vaccine and they've received it. And most of those have already received their, their second dose to become fully vaccinated. Is, um, that started in January and now prisons has gone back in the last couple of weeks with the second dose for those uh, individuals. So they're now uh, for the most part, fully vaccinated. Then the the greater part of the population uh, started this week, and during the next thirty days, there will be larger numbers that we'll see vaccinated. As far as an end timeline, I'm not sure. I really have a, a a good answer to that. I know we're going to continue to uh, administer vaccines as long as we have vaccines to administer, and we have individuals that want to be vaccinated. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I'll say this, we've got a queue forming. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, I'm glad that there, and, and I'm not surprised that we have questions, comments, and there's, this is a active discussion and I, and I, we're just going to make time for it. Uh, I would, however, ask that our questions sort of uh, keep a focus on sentencing related issues, not not because non sentence related issues don't have policy ramifications that could have policy ramifications for the work of our commission, but uh, it, 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 this is such a uh, potentially impactful um, settlement. Uh, I acknowledge, but uh, it's on our agenda today specifically because of the uh, prison population projection that we published. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I just want to let you know that uh, through the queue and, and communications I'm getting from Michelle, I've got uh, first coming back to uh, Susan Katz and Nelson, uh, and, and then I'm going to acknowledge uh, Representative Richardson. He has a question, and then Michelle uh, is going to uh, ask a question on behalf of Commissioner Battle, who uh, I think might have had some technical difficulties in, in, uh, in participating. So. At this point, I'm going to come back to you, Susan. As we uh, wait for uh, functionality here. I'm going to acknowledge uh, Representative Richardson. Uh, did you have a question or comment, Representative Richardson? Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, I want to call us back to a few meetings ago when uh, Representative Faircloth, who I've, I found to be one of the wisest people in the General Assembly uh, that we presently have, uh, asked a very courageous and a very appropriate question, and that is, when are we going to do something about uh, the nonviolent offenders that, that have gotten these uh, huge sentences for 
um, you know, drugs or something else that, that are presently in their 50s, 40s, and 50s uh, years of age um, that, that we could really do something with and not really hurt the society by, you know, releasing them. And I think it's the reason I'm calling us back to that is I think one of the reasons we're in this fix with COVID right now is because we've got that problem that we want that 6,000 pound elephant in the living room we won't deal with. And I know we're dealing with it, but I want us to deal with it quicker. So I just wanted to throw that out there that because I thought Representative Faircloth was very courageous to bring that subject up. And I think it's something we need to keep in the forefront when we discuss these issues. Thank you, Representative Richardson. I'll now uh, recognize Michelle with uh, Francis Battle's question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on behalf of Francis Battle, she wanted to ask, what conversations, if any, are there around victim notification for victims of those being released? Um, that's part of the process and we follow all the victims' rights, um, the, the uh, requirements that we have under the Victims' Rights Act for notice in terms of uh, there are several categories when, uh, related to prisons when individuals move and change custody levels or move to uh, different levels and then are released or transition in some way, um, as well as all the um, notification requirements that are uh, relate to community corrections and supervision in the community. So there's several of them we do. Uh, continue to do that and provide those notifications. And it is something that is considered up front as well in that selection process um, for any of the three components. So Nicola, I don't know if you wanna add to that in terms of the inner workings of that. Nicole is our lead for all the staff that's involved across prisons and community corrections and combined records and different areas of ACJJ that work through this on all these releases. Yeah, I, I'll just add, Mr. Moose, that um, we are um, using our normal release, if you will, procedures that would always um, that we would always go through as someone is going to uh, leave the system. So that victim notification, uh, looking at detainers, all those things that we would normally have to look at, we look at even with this ELC population, and we'll have to do that in this process. That's why um, there's more than 30 some professionals in their different disciplines who are involved in this doing a number of things all at the same time. Normally, we have nine months on that process to do all those same steps uh, as someone is getting prepared to leave our system. And, uh, and with this process, we will have to obviously really speed that process up um, to meet that settlement window. But the steps are exactly the same. We have not changed those sets of steps that we have to go through. Um, HIV testing is another one, which there is state law around that. All those things are having to get done and are getting done before those individuals, whether it's ELC, discretionary, however, you, all those things are getting done before folks um, leave the system. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I. I would like to now, uh, we're still having uh, some difficulty with uh, letting uh, Susan ask her question and, and make her comment. So we're going to try and work that out through the chat function or uh, text or email or something. Uh, but I do want to recognize Dr. McMurray. He has a question. Dr. McMurray. Yes. Um, the question from Representative McNeil, which I believe it was Tim Moose, and um, the question was what percent of inmates uh, have tested positive for COVID? Was was that the question? Yeah, oh, yeah okay. And the response I think was about 1% was, uh, is that correct? Sorry, I'm trying to find my uh, unmute button. That's correct as of today. Uh, if you look at this morning's numbers, there are about 1% of the current population that is active with COVID inside our prison facilities. Oh, okay. Now, uh, according to the NNO, there were like, what, 47 deaths and 95, 9,528 persons who tested positive for COVID? 
I don't have those numbers in front of me, so I can't comment as to what was in the news and observer, if it's accurate or not, but there is a large number that have tested positive throughout the pandemic. And we do have on our website, if you go to the DPS website and click on the COVID um, section that's there up front, and then you can get to the prison section. And then all the um, prison um, numbers in terms of COVID testing, positive results, hospitalizations, uh, offender deaths, um, staff test results, all those things are on our website. And I'll try to go over and click on that right now without. Well, I, I'm, looking at your, you know, I'm looking at that website right now and, and total test of positive is 9,786. Right, that would be correct. And there have been um, 47 deaths, as you said. We've also had um, nine staff in prisons that have passed away from COVID during the course of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah so that 1% perhaps doesn't fully reflect the number of tests of um, positive cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McMurray. I, I would say that. Um, only because I know Tim Moose well, that uh, we should feel free, my fellow commissioners, and contacting him offline um, on some of these broader uh, issues. Um, but at this time, uh, I, I believe it, we need to stop here. Let me uh, recognize Jenny um, because uh, she will be able to explain how the staff plan uh, to uh, manage the settlement's impact on our prison population projections. I'm not cutting this discussion off. I just think that if we can segue into the more pointed uh, prison population projections being impacted by the settlement, then it might uh, refine the scope of our uh, discussion at this point. So at this time, I'll recognize Jenny. Thank you, Judge Brown. Let me pull up the screen. What is it sharing? Hold on. Okay. Can everybody see the screen then? Okay. Um, feel free to ask questions as I go through this and what I'll be doing is summarizing the content of the prison projections document that you received with the meeting materials. So you can refer to that if you would like. And when applicable, the slides do reference the corresponding page number in the report. Um, as you all know, the prison projections are prepared annually in conjunction with the Department of Public Safety. And I'd like to thank Chief Deputy Secretary Moose and Deputy Secretary Nicole Sullivan and the DPS team at this time for their continued collaboration for providing data for the projections as well as for sharing their expertise with us on the correctional system. The projections are part of the Commission's original mandate to develop a projection tool that's used for long term planning of correctional resources so that we can know what the project, the, whether the population is projected to be within capacity, higher than capacity, or lower than capacity, so that we can um, proactively think about policy options or consider shifts in resources. In addition, the projections are used to um, determine capacity needs, not sorry, custody level needs for the Division of Adult Correction. And we also use the projections to produce the impact of um, changes to criminal penalties during the legislative session on the prison population. The projections are based on data from the Administrative Office of the Courts and the Department of Public Safety. The Administrative Office of the Courts provides the information on convictions and sentences imposed, and those data project the new admissions over the projection period and when those 
people will be released. The stock population from DPS includes offenders who are in prison at the beginning of the projection period and when they will be released over the um, course of the projection period. With the um, settlement becoming public just last week, the projections do not currently include any reductions that would occur as part of the settlement. I'll talk about that a little bit, you know, beginning on the next slide about how we'll be working with DPS on this. But I will note that the projections do include jail backlog as part of the, the, the projection. It's for anybody who is currently imprisoned. It also includes those who are in ELC status as part of the population. So since we've learned about the settlement, we have been working through how this affects the projections that we'll, we're discussing today. We're still digesting everything, but we are planning to revise the projections. But um, most of the assumptions and data that are used for the current projections will be applicable to the revised projections. So we thought it was still informative to present the projections to you today. So um, we wanted to, in, in thinking about what options for revisions, we wanted to make sure that we fully understand the provisions of the settlement and how to take them into account for the revised projections. And we'll be working with Nicole and her team on determining the approach that we'll use to make this revision. But two approaches that we're considering are, um, the first is determining an estimate of how many will be released early from the application of discretionary sentence credits and how many will be transitioned to ELC, and then removing this population from the projection and considering when the timing of that should occur. So that's, that's one of the methods. The other method includes actually rerunning the projections that we would be able to use revised data on the stock population to take into account new projected release dates for anybody who's being considered for um, this earlier release during 2021. However, um, an important consideration for that is the timing of available information. And that information may not be available until B DPS goes through the review process. But at this point, we have not settled on a final approach. We're still gathering the information that we need to inform the decision and we'll be meeting soon with Nicole and her team to discuss or, and to determine the best approach. I wanted to start by sharing some information on how actions taken by the court and correctional systems in response to the pandemic have impacted key data used for the projections, such as data on convictions and prison entries, and also um, ultimately impacted the prison population. And for the projections, we do start with fiscal year 2020 data, the most recent fiscal year of data available for the projections and for development of assumptions. But I just wanted to note at this time, I wanted to draw your attention to two handouts you have in your packet, um, the felony and misdemeanor quick facts. And just note that these do provide an overview of the data that were used for the projections, showing the composition of convictions from last fiscal year. And they also look at changes over time. So there are 10 year trends provided um, relating to felony convictions. But then with the misdemeanor convictions, I do want to note that we made a methodological change to the misdemeanor convictions included in our data this cycle, that we added class two and three traffic offenses to the convictions examined. And because of this, the composition of misdemeanor convictions has changed because there's such a high volume of convictions. And to look further at that change, the back page of the misdemeanor Quick Facts um, provides a comparison of fiscal year 2020 data with the data that we, um, before we made that change, so you can see how it changed convictions by adding those two classes of traffic offenses to the group. Are there any questions so far? Okay. 
this slide and the next include information that are, is not provided in the document, but that we did examine in um, producing the projections. And um, they show the impact that responses to the pandemic, um, primarily emergency orders that affected court operations, had on the volume of felony convictions and prison entries. And what you can see here is that although there have been some increases and decreases over um, the previous few fiscal years, that felony convictions and prison entries were somewhat stable prior to the onset of the pandemic. Yeah. However, with the pandemic, there was a decrease of 16% for convictions and a 13% um, decrease with entries. But um, the pandemic really only affected the last quarter of fiscal year 2020 with it starting in March and really in, into April, but it does continue to affect the court and correctional systems currently. And we don't know at this time how long it will continue to do so, although we hope things are kind of looking up. We also spent a lot of time this year looking at quarterly data to see how it could be used to inform the projections and to see whether things changed, for example, for that last quarter of fiscal year 2020 from April to June and um, whether there were changes other than just the volume. But um, we were looking, you know, are there changes in practices that would show up in in that quarter of data in terms of the type of prison entry or in terms of offense seriousness or active rates, um, those sort of things were what we were looking at. But um, DPS did provide additional data this year in order for us to look at prison entries through the end of the calendar year. And while we did see that the primary impact of COVID on the volume was from April to June of last year, we did see that um, that prison entries did increase as court proceedings expanded in the July through December timeframe. However, they did not increase to the previous levels. In looking at this chart, you can see the prison population by fiscal year and that there was relative stability of the population prior to COVID. However, the population declined 7% from March to June 2020 and then an additional 6% from June to December for a total 13% decline. And currently the population is around 29,000 um, or so uh, between 29 and 29.5 when you include um, the 300 that are on jail backlog. And so currently we're about 1,000 lower or potentially more than the December population that is shown on this chart for 2020. Okay, so here is the table that everyone, I guess, turns to this page first often when when we're doing this in person. But um, anyway, as you can see on this table, the current projection is substantially lower than last year's projections as a result of the system-wide impact of the pandemic. And as I mentioned earlier, this projection does not account for anything relating to the, the settlement. But in working through the settlement with those 3,500 primarily coming in um, this year within 180 days, although they will span the end of fiscal year 2021 and the beginning of fiscal year 2022, um, it's likely that those will affect primarily then the first two years of the projections, although there could be some additional impacts. We'll have to consider whether there are additional impacts in the later years of the projection. But, um, the current projection, we did include an adjustment for COVID based on the decrease in felony convictions over the past year. The projections needed to be adjusted downward as a result of decreases that continued beyond that were already um, in the data that we used. 
However, we did assume that the largest decrease had already occurred, but we also considered how long the pandemic might affect the system. And based on where things stood at the time, we thought that that impact wouldn't go beyond fiscal year 2022. So we only adjusted the first two years of the projections and a similar adjustment was made for the juvenile projections as well. Here, you can also see that the capacity estimates are, uh, you know, 31,690 for standard operating capacity and 36,433 for um, expanded operating capacity. And in comparing the projected population with capacity, the projections are um, pr below EOC for the entire 10 year period and below SOC for all but three years of the period. And historically, though, the projections have been much closer to EOC than to SOC. Are there any questions before I move forward? Okay. And this just gives you a visual description of the table that was just shown. And you can see how close the prison projections are to um, standard operating capacity, much farther away from expanded operating capacity at this time. And I'll just review this one quickly as well. You've seen this data already, but it just um, is presented by month here. So you can see how the current population compares to the historical population, looking at a 15 period year period of time. And prior to the um, prior to COVID, the population was stable at um, fiscal year 20, 2005 levels, but now it's below those levels. In terms of the assumptions, I'll just highlight a few of these and note again that the assumptions were determined using data from fiscal year 2020, but we do recognize that data from fiscal year 2020 may be limited in its applicability due to the ongoing pandemic. And to address those limitations, we made estimates um, based upon actions taken by the court and correctional systems in response to the pandemic. And we brought in that quarterly data when possible. And when we um, receive new data that shows the impact of the pandemic, we'll be able to take that into account as well. But um, the few assumptions that I just want to point out is that we did take into account growth rates in addition to the COVID adjustment. But in terms of the data on convictions, that while there were fewer convictions going coming through the system, we didn't see any changes in the behavior of the court system during that last quarter of fiscal year 2020. Now, that might not be the case now, but during that time period, there were no changes in the distribution by offense class or in the percentage of active sentences imposed or in the length of sentences imposed. But we'll, you know, we'll continue looking at the data as it becomes available to see whether that is still the case. In terms of prison admissions, I'll just note that because of the pandemic, the revocation rates for probation and PRS did decrease. The probation revocation rate decreased from 24% to 19%, and the PRS revocation rate de decreased from 26% to 22%. But we didn't see um, any changes in the time to revocation or the time served for revocation. They were similar to the previous year. And then I'll also just note briefly that um, the projections do account for those who are in ELC status, as well as those who are in jail backlog status, that we did an adjustment for backlog at the beginning of the fiscal year to include them in the stock population. And we also made an adjustment um, to the backlog to um, take into account the backlog that is still on, ongoing at this time, although it has decreased over the current year. Just one last slide. Um, this shows the distribution of the projected prison population and how it reflects the prioritization of resources for violent and repeat offenders under structured sentencing. 
the volume, the active rate, and the sentence length for these groups or convictions are the key determinants of the composition of the population. And with class through A through D felonies, even though they're the smallest group, they have the biggest impact of, sorry, smallest group of convictions. They have the biggest impact on the population because of mandatory active sentences and their long sentence lengths. While class H and I felonies, they account for the largest volume of convictions, but they do not account for, for the, um, they account for a smaller um, portion of the prison population because fewer receive active sentences and their time served is typically less than one year on average. That concludes the information I have, but I'm happy to take any questions. As uh, I sort of survey the room, um, if you could uh, revert to not sharing your screen, it helps me see everyone Absolutely. throwing their hand up. Um, I'll just uh, thank you, Jenny. I, I will uh, make a, a, a offer uh, to my fellow commissioners, uh, and that is uh, I don't want to uh, um, miss this opportunity while you your 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 uh, your brains are operational on this subject of the settlement um, because now we've refined it to um, the more narrow focus of prison population. But make no mistake, uh, the settlement could have much farther relevant ramifications to structured mm -hmm. sentencing and the work of the sentencing commission. So I appreciate the breadth of the questions, and I want to facilitate that. And so the staff will be available to collect questions from uh, fellow commissioners and get answers from DPS. Um, that That is probably only fair to Nicole and Tim as well. So I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to pass the baton and just put it in your lap to have to reach out afterwards to follow through with, with Tim. Staff is gonna help facilitate uh, getting answers to your questions. We can collect those in a variety of formats and uh, we'll explore that later in the meeting. But um, having said that, um, one of the things that I had a takeaway from that I'll just re uh, observe uh, from uh, Nicole and Tim's presentation is um, that, uh, that there is a commitment uh, uh, to um, in, in, in following through with their obligations from the settlement to not interfere with minimum sentences. Uh, and that was a concern that I had, and that is clearly not something that is a part of their plan to comply. So, you know, the integrity of the, our truth and sentencing and the integrity of not monkeying with adjudications and dispositions on minimum sentencing is something that uh, put me somewhat at ease about the broad terms of the settlement. Um, but having said that, uh, any questions uh, from my questioners, uh, from my commissioners on uh, Jenny's presentation about uh, prison population. Seeing no hands, um, we'll move on uh, at this point. Thank you, Jenny. And again, th once again, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Nicole, for uh, being available on such short notice. At this time, we'll transition to uh, the agenda item that includes uh, uh, staff member Tamara Flincham, she's going to present on the Youth Development Center projections. Uh, we now do have Billy Lasser. I acknowledge that he would be present and may, may be featured in any discussion that may uh, be a part of this presentation. So at this time, I'll recognize Tamara Flincham. Thank you, Judge Brown. Um, good morning. I uh, quickly want to just mention commissioners before I share my screen receive two documents in your packet that's connected to the YDC projections. One is a quick fax. It's a one pager that has the fiscal year 2020 dispositions on one side and then trend data on the back side. Um, some good information in that. I won't be able to talk about all of it in the time allotted, but you would also have received. Um, the uh, YDC projections document. So let me do a little bit of magic here and share my screen. Okay. So um, 
I just wanted to um, say that uh, it's certainly just like the adult uh, prison projections. It's been a challenging year uh, to do projections. Uh, that the same is true for the Youth Development Center or YDC projections. It was a combined effort this year. Uh, Jennifer Lutz on staff worked with me on this project as well as uh, several other staff members. Uh, we, they were also done in conjunction with the juvenile justice section of DACJJ. Uh, and in particular, I want to thank them this year uh, for multiple meetings, uh, Deputy Commissioner Lassiter, as well as Kim Quittis and especially Megan Peralt, who provided us with multiple uh, data requests um, while throughout this process was all were available for questions. So um, it has been uh, a challenging process. So um, Jenny kind of covered uh, the purpose of the projections with the adult, this, that purpose um, still applies to uh, the juvenile projections. Uh, the data uh, that that was given to us comes from NC Join uh, Juvenile Justice Automated System, um, and we have the same two um, populations that, that, of data that we are using. The new admissions um, are the fiscal year uh, 2020 uh, juvenile delinquent dispositions. Um, that that is the starting the estimate, if you will, the population that we're going to be estimating. The stock population is juveniles in a YDC as of June 30th, 2020. And just a quick reminder that juveniles must be 10 years of age to be committed to a YDC. And uh, generally that commitment is uh, at least six months. It can, it tends to be around a year. I think this year it was 14 months. Um, the other thing, one of the things that made it challenging this year and we knew about it, uh, commissioners may remember in uh, 2017, the General Assembly, passed the Juvenile Justice Reinvestment Act, which increased the age of juvenile jurisdiction to include most 16 and 17 year olds. Um, the raise the age went into effect um, December 1st of 2019, which was halfway through our fiscal year of data. Um, you'll hear me refer to the raise the age youth, and those are those 16 and 17 year olds at offense. And then the non raise the age would be the juveniles eligible for dispositions, which is age six to 15. Um, at offense. Two factors, um, I just mentioned one impacted the juvenile justice system this past fiscal year and certainly impacted uh, dispositions in uh, YDC population. I just mentioned the raise the age, it was expected, we planned for it. We anticipated that raise the age would impact YDC admissions, releases, and length of stay, which are all key components for us developing the projections. Um, it was anticipated it would increase the number of youth in the juvenile justice system. And then the unexpected happened with the pandemic. Um, and in talking about the pandemic, the responses to the pandemic kind of stalled our um, anticipated impact of Raise the Age, um, particularly on the dispositions and the YDC population. Um, the responses of the school closures um, and the reliance on virtual learning Schools are a major referral source for juvenile complaints and the uh, Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee's um, interim report on the juvenile age that was just published in January reported that 45% of complaints in calendar year 2019 were school-based and in calendar year 2020, that dropped, decreased to 16% of all complaints. Um, the other um, response was the changes in that affected the juvenile system was changes in courthouse operations, which affected juvenile court proceedings um, and impacted the number of dispositions. So I uh, wanted to just kind of show you some trend data that we're seeing. So um, while the juvenile complaints did increase 30% during the first um, year of Raise the Age, and that's data from the JJAC report, um, delinquent dispositions declined. And you can see here they declined 21% um, between fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 2020. If you look at just non-Raise the Age juveniles, that was a 27% decrease. Um, and if you look at where raise the age is occurring, we did see in that fiscal year of data, we've got about 7% of the disposition, dispositions are from raise the age youth. Uh, we were also able to get uh, current data 
So this is a partial year of our current fiscal year. Um, you can see that if I compare the same time frame, the first seven months to last fiscal year, um, we're still at a 10% decrease in dispositions, but we have increased the number of raise the age youth, and they're representing about 36% of dispositions at this point. Similar to what Jenny just showed you with the adult, we looked at it by quarter to see where trends are and what the impact of the pandemic um, and what was going on with the courts and how they handled the dispositions. Um, fiscal year 2019, uh, that's a pretty typical pattern. Uh, for the quarters, you'll see uh, kind of a, uh, it's different from the adult system. Um, you see a little bit of a decrease during what I called the holiday quarter. Um, but when we got to fiscal year 2020, um, what happened is raise the age occurred in December. We started to see some dispositions um, uh, occurring in this third quarter here. Um, but instead with the COVID pandemic, it just kind of stalled what was going on with dispositions. So we didn't get that return to normal, if you will. And then the fourth quarter, um, man, that's the COVID quarter. Um, that's a 56% decrease in dispositions. We are picking up more raise the age use in that quarter. It's around 34%. And then um, I found this really intriguing. Um, the, the current fiscal year for the first quarter after this COVID quarter, um, that's a 200% increase in dispositions. So the courts were certainly had opened up and we can see it reflected there. Um, I'm not sure that level is going to stay because in the second quarter, um, again, we do have the holidays going on, but remember there was also that second surge. Um, and I think there were a few, you know, some court closures going on during that point, but um, that's, um, that's kind of where the status of that is. I want to um, talk a little bit real quickly about um, the impact of um, the school closures on particularly misdemeanors and what does that mean? Um, if you look at, because generally uh, dispositions are primarily misdemeanors and always have been, but from uh, fiscal year 2019 to fiscal year 2020, that's a 26% drop in misdemeanors. Um, and that is based off of the fact that they're um, you know, primarily coming from schools. That's one of the, uh, things that we're seeing. If you look at felonies, uh, while there was a 26% decrease in misdemeanors, it was just 4% um, decrease in felonies. However, I wanted to point out, if you look for this 2020 year, if you look, the percentage of felonies have increased. And I, I wanted you to think about the data a little bit differently because even though the percentage has increased, the actual numbers of felonies decreased. And it, that doesn't necessarily mean because the percentage is higher that juveniles have committed more serious offenses during that time. It just means, or my takeaway is that one of the pipelines for misdemeanor, which are schools, um, was closed or, due to the pandemic. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see at what point do misdemeanors come back online as school does uh, remove, move further to in-person. Um, the current data, um, is uh, quite interesting as well. You still continue to see the decrease in um, misdemeanors. Uh, I don't have data for this, but one of the things I suspect may be also going on is that the court is being more efficient in its utilization of its resources and prioritizing the more serious offenses. So, I, but again, I don't have data there. So what's happening with YDC population? Um, you can see even uh, before the pandemic hit for fiscal year 2020, the, this is the average monthly YDC population by year. And it was below um, fiscal year 2019, even before the pandemic. And if you look at our current fiscal year, um, while it still looks, it, there's some growth in the population. I will say that the, uh, uh, as of, February, it's the average population is 153, and today the YDC's population is 147. So I'm not sure how quickly it's going to come back. I, I think it's going to be a slow return. Um, looking at raise the age juveniles that are in YDC's, 
Um, what you see here is, I, I think I shared this with commissioners. I want you to focus on the dotted and dashed lines. Um, what we do see is with the raise the age, we are starting to see them in the YDCs. Uh, most of the decreases were occurring in the non raise the age population. And in the current fiscal year, we've seen that that trend continue uh, with raise the age youth uh, uh, increasingly more in a YDC. And at this point in January, they're representing about 24% um, of the population. So before I get to the projections and the capacity, I just want to mention that we had to address that partial year of raise the age data for the, um, the 16 and 17 year olds were in both the juvenile and in the um, adult system. We didn't want to lose those 187 youth that were in the juvenile system. So um, we used the same methodology as last year, but we combined the 187 with adult convictions for 16 and 17 year olds, and we use that base pop population, if you will, to project. So um, this is on page four in your document. As Jenny said, this is the first page you would turn to if I gave you this document. Um, as I mentioned, here are the two populations that we had to project. Um, if and we combine those to get the current combined uh, projection. As Jenny mentioned, we also applied, so if you try to add these numbers, we applied a um, COVID adjustment to the first two years. We are projecting that there is sufficient YDC capacity for each year of the projection. Um, I'll, I'll mention it's a footnote in the document, but uh, juvenile justice plans to open 35 renovated beds at CA Dillon in December of 2022. And they're expected to open the new 60 bed YDC facility in March of 2023. And both of those facilities will be flexible space for them, meaning that they can be used for both detention or commitment purposes. Um, the last column is the difference between the current projection and capacity. I also want to point out um, in the document that was mailed the hard copy to you, there is an error in the hard copy. So if you hang on to that, please note that the second year should be 21 bed difference instead of 56. Um, so the only thing I will comment uh, about this, um, if you're looking at the previous uh, uh, projection, you'll see that what we're projecting is all lower from our previous projection. Um, that's due to the COVID pandemic. We also had the stock population was their starting point was much lower. It was 151 uh, for in June of 30. 2019, 2020, the year before we had two, we started the starting point was 204. Um, and that makes a difference when we're dealing with such low numbers. Um, Jenny kind of talked about the our process and uh, generally most of the, uh, for our assumptions that go in the projection, um, generally it's based off of fiscal year 2020 data, but this year we looked at um, lots of other trends and more current data. What I will say about this, and uh, no worries, I'm not going over all of these numbers. This is exactly the document that's uh, in your, our table that's in your document. Because of uh, addressing the population separately, we do have two separate assumptions. So when we did have data for raise the age, we used it. Um, some slight differences uh, in the growth rate that primarily is due to the state demographer projecting um, uh, more growth in the 16 to 17 year old population of North Carolina. Um, one of the things, uh, both projections, I do want to mention, account for how juveniles will be committed to a YDC, whether by a new offense, probation violation, or PRS revocation. And that's important because it determines how long a juvenile will be in a YDC. Um, we didn't have any data to uh, inform us about the raised the age juveniles. All of the juveniles that are in a disposition or in the YDC, sorry, are coming in from a new offense. So we made the assumption that they're going to come through just like the non raised the age juveniles did to a YDC. I'm 
confident that those numbers may change in the future, but we'll be updating that as we get a full year's data for next year's um, projection. Um, one other point I want to just point out, the level three dispositions, uh, historically for the non-raised age youth, that's the commitment rate, has been 3% solid since the beginning of time. When we looked at the raised the age youth, um, when we tried to examine that 187, their commitment rate was 8%. And this is where we were really having to pull into other current data Anytime you have something that's just beginning to implement, you're just, you kind of have to have a little bit of caution in looking at it. So we did use calendar year data because when we had more uh, juveniles to look at for the raise the age, that leveled out to 5%. So we felt pretty comfortable with that. So real quickly, if you can indulge me, I'm going to share some data with you. Um, and this will be quick. Uh, we looked at calendar year dispositions uh, for raise the age compared to non raise the age. Um, felt like we had enough data. I'm not going to just, just, you've got the numbers in front of you. I'm sure we'll share the PowerPoint. But um, just some general takeaways from this. Uh, remember that raise the age youth um, for serious offenses, uh, most, well, most uh, all A through G's should be transferred to the adult system. There's a few that um, are in the juvenile system. We won't go into that, but generally when I talk about serious offenses for uh, raise the age, it's class H and I felonies and class A1 misdemeanors. And what we're finding is that more uh, raise the age youth, they commit more serious offenses compared to non raise the age youth. When you look at their delinquency history, um, this is not surprising. The non raised the age juveniles have less involvement in the juvenile justice system compared to raise the age. Uh, being in there, they're going to have longer to ac accumulate those dispositional points. And then I've kind of already stolen my own thunder, but when you look at disposition level and compare the two groups, more raised the age youth have level three and level two dispositions imposed um, compared to the non raised age youth. So We'll continue to monitor the impact of Raise the Age and the pandemic on the juvenile justice system and dispositions in the YDC and can report back to commissioners as needed, but that's all that I have right now. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Tamara. Do we have any questions uh, for Tamara about YDC? I don't want to miss this opportunity to uh, call on uh, Secretary of Juvenile Justice Billy Lassiter if he has anything to to add. If if that was a key takeaway for him in that uh, final slide, uh, uh, any any comments on some of the uh, data there? I just want to um, thank you, uh, Chairman Brown, and thank you to uh, Michelle and Tamara and. Jenny and the whole crew, um, and thanks to my staff, Kim and Megan, especially that worked on these projections. It, it, it is a complicated year with uh, raise the age and with COVID, um, two extreme variables that, that obviously change the dynamics of, of how we do projections. And so I just want to thank them for their hard work on this. And it is a, the, the key takeaway that Tamara presented to you at the end there, I think is um, exactly right. Uh, what we have seen with the raise the age population is that they're, they are more risky. Um, as far as our risk assessment tool that we do with them, and they have more history, um, and so therefore they're more likely to get committed. And so we we have seen an uptick with with that population of the chances of them getting committed because they do have some history points, delinquency history points that are adding in um, to those calculations. I think the other part of that is that um, uh, law enforcement and then the fact that uh, uh, kids aren't in school have really during the COVID pandemic have chosen to see if they could divert directly, meaning through law enforcement, um, before they even bring a kid to us as a, a juvenile complaint, they've done a lot of diversions um, in the community. And I think that's um, driven down some of the lower risk kids and therefore they're not showing up as a percentage of that population right now. So that might also be causing us to see that higher risk population is that those direct, I call them direct diversions before they even get to juvenile justice are occurring by law enforcement in the community and um, we're not seeing those kids as much anymore. So the kids that are coming in, 
are higher risk and they have more serious offenses. And I think that's exactly what uh, Tamara's data just pointed out. And if you ask uh, the, the the staff in the field, they would tell you the exact same thing, which means that our caseloads um, in, in our um, court counseling offices have been really focused on um, more intense services for those kids. But but I want to thank again Michelle and, and her, her staff for uh, working with us on this uh, more complicated report this year. Great job, guys. Thank you, Billy, so much. Uh, we're now transitioning to our next presentation. Uh, our uh, staff member, Megan Boyd Ward, will uh, present on the statewide misdemeanor confinement program. So at this time, I'll acknowledge uh, Megan Boyd Ward. Thank you, Judge Brown, so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you're seeing that okay. Great. Um, I also just wanted to point out that the uh, materials related to this presentation were included in the email that Michelle sent out, which was, uh, I believe, yesterday. Um, so just re please uh, refer to that for more detail, um, but it wasn't in your, your printed packet. So, so as Judge Brown said, I'm going to talk to you today about the statewide misdemeanor confinement program, or the SMCP, as we like to call it, and the capacity projections for that. Um, so, really, the purpose or goal of the SMCP projection is to inform future capacity, and that assists with resource planning. And that's because if the program does not have the adequate um, space. The, those misdemeanors that would be housed in the SMCP go to DPS. And so there's some factors that we look at um, in doing our projections, some of which I'm just gonna go into quick detail here. And then we have, I have some additional slides that go over some of those uh, last factors in more detail. Now, in terms of the internal jail dynamics, this is very important because there are types, two different types of populations. There are those that are mandatorily housed and those that are optionally housed. The mandatory population are some of those that are just um, what you would traditionally think about pretrial inmates, misdemeanors under serving sentences under 90 days, and those that are um, on the jail backlog. For voluntary, that's really what we're talking about with this capacity projection. We're talking about the SMCP inmates. And those are the um, inmates serving DWI sentences or misdemeanors who are serving sentences over 90 days. Now, in terms of participating in the SMCP, you can either be a sending or receiving county. Uh, participation is voluntary. So a receiving county are those that offer up bed space in the program, while all other counties are considered sending counties. Now, for these last few points, the historical participation of the counties, the historical capacity and external factors are major considerations that we look at in our projections. And especially as we've been hearing about all morning, those external factors are a huge component in this year. And that takes me to the effect that COVID-19 has had on our jail population. So similar to some of the information that uh, Jenny and Tamara already discussed, there were actions taken by both the courts, DPS, and local jails that have just changed our overall jail population. And of course, we're talking about, you know, suspending court hearings, um, uh, changes with uh, the number of, of um, inmates that are being housed due to jail backlog. Um, and finally, also receiving counties in the SMCP who temporarily suspended their participation in, in the program. And so we know these actions have affected the overall jail population as well as the beds committed to the SMCP, and that really affects the accuracy of our potential projection. Uh, and of course, we don't know how much longer this is going to hap be, be happening, and so we will continue to monitor those effects. What we do know, though, is that in general, COVID has had an effect on the overall jail population, which is what you're seeing on the right hand of, of the slide here. We dropped just in the last year by a total of 28% decrease when you compare 2019 to 2020 in terms of the total jail average daily, daily population. So that's pretty significant. Now, in terms of our uh, more sort of drilling down a little bit more on the effects within the SMCP, we have uh, three categories of counties that were our receiving counties. There were some that remained online, some that went offline for a period of time and have actually returned online and now are receiving 
counties again. And then finally, we have some that are still remaining offline. Um, the, uh, the Sheriff's Association was actually kind enough to partner with us on, on doing a survey, and they were able to ask all of the counties that were currently still in an offline status, and about half of them responded and did say that they would be returning to the program. They just weren't sure at what point they would be able to, because of course, the effects of COVID are still ongoing, and that's going to be dependent upon their local jurisdiction's decisions. Um, but at the time of this report, we currently have 15 counties that are in, in, in an offline status, which of course continues to affect the overall capacity of the program. The capacity uh, information and population trend that you see here shows that in the first few years of the program, we were relatively consistent and have seen really more of a decline. We didn't see more of a decline until around um, the fiscal year 2017. After that, we were in a pretty consistent four percentage decrease uh, until, of course, COVID. Then, beginning in March 2020, we, of course, saw unprecedented drops in both the capacity of the program as well as the average monthly population, and that's reflected here on, on this uh, chart. And just to kind of illustrate, in February, it dropped, capacity dropped to 1,355. And by the end of uh, the fiscal year in July 2020, capacity had dropped all the way to 923. So in, in making our projections, we of course have to make assumptions about um, how, how to, um, what, what factors go into the, the projections themselves. This year, because of COVID, we had both short-term and long-term assumptions. The short-term assumptions really only apply to those counties um, the different statuses of the receiving counties. So we assumed that uh, remain online counties would per participate at the same level uh, as they had before the pandemic. Those that returned online uh, would stay at their existing level of participation. And, and the final category of the remain offline, we actually have two scenarios that I will show you. One, a full recovery and another of a partial recovery just due to the uncertainty. Those long-term assumptions uh, really only apply to the counties who remained online, who continued to, to operate in the same fashion as they did before COVID. And so we look at things like the jail backlog, which as of the end of uh, December 31st, 2020 was 657. We also assume that receiving and sending, sending counties will continue in that status. Um, this year we were not, uh, we, we had to assume that no new beds would be added due to construction based on um, surveys of jail administrators. And finally, we assumed a negative 5% growth rate in the SMCP capacity based on a three-year average growth rate in fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 2020. So here you can see our first scenario, which again is that full recovery of the beds lost to the pandemic. And we see that full recovery by the third year of the projection. Um, the overall, the capacity is projected to recover from 976 currently to 1,240 in June uh, 2025, which is an increase of 264 beds or 27% increase. In um, contrast, we have our scenario two, which is uh, thinking about if there's just a more, a little bit of an uncertainty. Um, here we have a partial recovery by year three. Uh, which is based on the historical consistency of those offline counties. But overall, we're projected to recover from 976 to 1,106 by June 2025, which again, that's an increase of 130 beds or a 13% increase. And finally, in terms of looking at these projections as a whole, I just have some considerations and some things to keep in mind. Scenarios one and two do indicate, indicate an increase in the SMC, SMCP capacity through fiscal year 2023, which is those offline beds coming back online due to COVID. After that, we see a decline in capacity in fiscal years 2024 and 2025, which really is reflective of the patterns that we were seeing prior to COVID. In addition, you have to keep in mind, of course, that this projected capacity could be further changed because we just still don't know what's going to happen um, in terms of the effects from the pandemic. And also something that we just always deal with this particular program is that bed participation is voluntary, which creates some uncertainty for future planning. 
Uh, and finally, just something to keep in mind when, when looking at these projections, any issues related to funding are not addressed here. Uh, and with that, that's the materials I have, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. And I'm sorry if that was a little bit quick, but we're just running short on time. Well done, Megan. If you'll uh, stop sharing your screen, I'll survey yeah, our group. Yeah, Thank you. Um, any comments or questions on SMCP? We did have Jesse Scholler uh, also participating, and if needed, we can call upon him. Thank you for uh, joining the meeting. Um, at this time, we are running short on time. I'm going to be uh, mindful of our deadline for adjournment, but I do want to uh, recognize uh, our executive director because she has a brief comment about this uh, important work that uh, the staff have engaged and are moving forward with uh, regarding the sentencing practices study. Michelle? Thank you, Judge Brown. Just a two second update um, in the interest of time on the sentencing practices study that we've been talking about for the last several meetings. Um, we are in the process of engaging an expert consultant in criminology to assist with some of the more sophisticated data analyses that we've been talking about for several months now. Um, we had hoped to have that in place for this meeting, um, but it's just taking much longer than expected. So um, stay tuned on that. And um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you want to have me um, inform the commission about the tentative date dedicated to um, this topic in May, or if you wanted to, to let them know that that is um, a possibility at this point. Okay, so mark your calendars tentatively for a, a sentencing practices meeting on May 7th, that's a Friday. Um, if we have enough information from um, our work with this potential consultant, then we would hope to um, have a meeting at that point dedicated to this topic um, for you all to digest that information and discuss it. And so more information will be forthcoming about whether that um, meeting is needed, but I just wanted to get that out there for you all um, as a tentative date at this point. And Mr. Chairman, I think that um, Clerk Mixon has his hands up. Thank you, yes, Commissioner Mixon. I apologize. I must have bumped that somehow. That's fine. I, I, I'll just uh, recognize that uh, the interest that has been uh, noted at prior uh, gatherings about this sentencing practices study, it's something that uh, we have a lot of uh, focus for and fire for. And uh, as uh, our fellow commissioner, Representative McNeil, uh, suggested, it's not something we should rush through. Uh, it's something that uh, we should be deliver about, deliberate about, and we are. And so it's no surprise that it's maybe taking a little more time than uh, may have been forecasted uh, last fall. But uh, thank you for that update, Michelle. Real quick. So um, we need to form a legislative review subcommittee. That's a statutory uh, duty that we have, and there are some uh, necessary uh, timelines for us to convene following the passage of bills. Um, and so, uh, Number one, I need to solicit volunteers. This is your invitation to serve. Uh, many of you I see some hands going up and we'll note that. Um, and uh, we we have fixed a date um, already, March the 19th. Please mark that on your calendars, Friday, March 19th, for the first possibly only installment. Uh, my speculation for you is that uh, it's likely to be more than one meeting, but they'll be short um, and uh, to the point. Um, I do uh, need for us to, uh, without objection, uh, form that subcommittee. Um, I don't, it doesn't requ require a, a uh, roll call vote, so we'll dispense without noting no objection. The subcommittee is formed. Um, and uh, there are a couple other things. Um, I guess I would acknowledge that uh, there's been some chat. And, and if you're trying to watch the presentation, read the materials and do the chat, sometimes you don't get to see it all. So we'll leave the meeting open or perhaps even staff can capture it and share it out in case you missed something. Um, I've tried to be uh, specific in thanking all of our presenters, but uh, it, this is the proper time for me to acknowledge that uh, uh, as a sentencing commission, uh, we benefit uh, from the best staff in state government. Uh, so thank you to Michelle and all the staff. Um, and uh, I want to again welcome our newest commissioner, uh, DA uh, uh, Mr. Waters. Um, 
And it's no surprise to any of us, right? COVID, um, we're meeting this way, COVID. Uh, COVID has been impactful. Um, you know, the school closure uh, was a radical influence over um, what we heard about juvenile justice and what's gone on there. It's affected us in other ways too, but certainly on that population. Um, this settlement that just uh, didn't come out of the blue, but now that the 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 the, uh, you know, the, the writing has been published and and we can see uh, what what it's going to mandate uh, that that is an impact uh, and there's fallout and again COVID COVID continues to impact us um, and we here we are now having endured it for a year so um, there's just really no surprise there but uh, make no mistake about it. Um, staff have adjusted and, and, and acknowledged and, and, and tried to um, build in assumptions as, as, as best they can. And uh, I want to thank them for, for that. I want to thank you for, uh, for joining the meeting and for your attention and participation. Um, before uh, we adjourn, um, I would just uh, mention beyond the March 19th, uh, meeting, um, the sentencing uh, practices study meeting, as Michelle highlighted, was May the 7th, and our next full commission meeting is June 4th, and I'll uh, forecast for you that that's also going to be vir virtual. Uh, Michelle, anything before we adjourn? <clears throat> um, just a, a reminder that um, the commission's appointment cycle is ending at the end of this fiscal year, so we will be soliciting um, appointments, and if you'd like to continue serving, we would just encourage you to reach out to your appointing authorities to let them know. Those solicitations will go out in May, so I just wanted to mention that now because it will be before the, the next June convening that, that we'll be sending out those um, requests for appointments. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Sheriff. I, I, there was something happening when you were making mention of the uh, legislative report from the subcommittee. I did not hear who they, they were. Something happened with my computer. My, my screen went dull for a second and I never heard who was on the committee. Uh, I, I was speeding through that. And so that's my uh, mistake. Um, I, I, I just solicited uh, volunteers. And so if I see your hand uh, and, and the staff noted other hands from Lindsay and others, and uh, we'll be reaching out to you and, and probably reaching out to a few of you that, that didn't throw your hand up. So um, <laughs> you'll be hearing from us. All right, thanks. Thank you, Sheriff. Yes, Further, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair, do we have a time for May 7th? Dr. McMurray, um, uh, meetings are, uh, uh, almost universally convened at 10 o'clock and Michelle is, is confirming that for me. So 10 o'clock, yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Further. Well, it's 12.01. So uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining. Have a great weekend and go Duke. <laughs> the meeting already ended. <laughs> Take care, out. guys. All right. All right.